So I'm going to follow up on a different set of cases compared to what Nick is looking at. And it's more about buildings and different locations where we would uh, place buildings. In building design with the new NGA update, there's really two places where we're most affected by the updates. One is in the ground motion prediction equations, which is what's been presented uh, all day and it's pretty much for the design spectra. And the other one is it's in the database and the actual ground motion records that we would use for nonlinear response history analysis. So I'm going to be talking about these two issues here. So first we're going to go with the ground motion prediction equations um, and how do we calculate the design spectra from these ground motion prediction equations. Nico's gone through the process today. He's shown it to you for the general spectrum and the map spectra. And I'm going to take that and follow it with what you would do in a site-specific analysis uh, where you would actually not just scale, apply the Neher factors to a, site, a reference site class uh, BC, but you actually calculate the spectral values at the surface. So now you're really bringing in uh, shear wave velocity effects. And then the other way you could do a site-specific analysis is still do it for a rock site at the reference base and then do a site response analysis. But I'm not going to be focusing on that. So the in, I think the most beautiful feature almost of these ground motion prediction equations is just the continuous function of shear wave velocity. So now we really bring in um, as much as just a single proxy value of VS30. If your site is somewhere between a site class C and a site class D, you actually can have a better representation of the hazard at the site. So this you really see it when you're doing your site specific analyses. Uh, of course, as was presented from uh, Mark this morning, there's a lot more going into the new hazard analyses. There's different source characterizations. Uh, we may have different probabilities associated with that um, and different sets of ground motion prediction equations. So what I really want to focus on to really isolate the update from 2008 to 2013-14 is looking at the deterministic uh, in the 84 percentile response spectra that we would use in determining our design spectrum. Of course, you know, there's a uniform risk spectra. We're looking at maximum component spectra, um, but I really want to focus on the 84 percentile here. Um, what I did for the comparisons, I picked a different number of sites and then I pulled out the spreadsheet. The 2008 one is available. I managed to get my hands on a 2013 version. It's a bootleg copy of it, uh, but I'm confident in the results being similar to what you will get um, when it's released in the next couple of weeks. So what I did is I took the same sources and just really compare what the ground motion prediction equations are for these different cases. Um, you guys have seen the response spec and design spectra in two different ways already. The seismologists like to look at the entire period range, so you're used to seeing in a log-log scale. Um, the geotechnical engineers and Nick this morning is more interested in the high frequency range. So you do a semi-log scale. Um, but structural engineering, we're really interested in what is the effect of the ground motions in a period range anywhere between quarter to half a second to two to three, even four to six seconds if you have base isolated structures. So I'm going to be looking at all this response spectra in a linear to linear scale. So it really gives you a better understanding of what's going on in the different period ranges that I'm interested in. From the ground motion prediction equations, we've been talking about medians. And Nick has also talked about the sigmas. Well, in the design spectra, we have to bring the two together and actually add them up. So all my comparisons are going to be looking at the medium, but also the medium plus one standard deviation. And we're going to be looking at the averages of the different ground motion equations, prediction equations, as well as the individual ground motion prediction equations. Um, so the first set of comparison is the weighted average. Uh, I followed the same weighting criteria that uh, USGS is using of assigning uh, a weight factor of one to the first four ground motion prediction equations and then of a half to the Idris ground motion pr prediction equation. Of course, you can normalize those to add up to one. Um, and then I'm plotting in the plots, I'm plotting the spectral response as a function of period for the median, median plus one standard deviation. And then in the blue line, you also have an idea of what the ratio is just to really just quantify whether we're increasing above one or decreasing below one. You'll see different patterns going up and down depending on your site conditions and your site. Also, just to more reference, I'm also comparing uh, different ground motion prediction equations. I put the 2008 values on the left and I put the 2013 values on the right. Uh, same 
color schemes um, and everything. And the point of these comparison is, and I think Nick has already focused on this, some of the ground motion prediction equations go up, some go down, and then the averages we've already compared before. So I went around the West Coast and I randomly pick a number of different sites. Uh, they just happen to match some of the sites that we visited for our seminars and some are important sites. In the Bay Area, I actually picked three sites, uh, Berkeley, San Francisco, and Oakland because they have different distances to different faults and different site conditions. I also picked um, LA, Salt Lake City, and Seattle. What's really nice, and you can see it from the table here, we've got different shear wave velocities, so different site stiffnesses, uh, different distances and magnitudes. These are just the deterministic magnitudes um, that we have from the 2008 models. And I also have different fault mechanisms. In my ground motion prediction equations, these were really the only things that I really varied. Everything else I either kept constant, um, such as the regions, uh, or I just defaulted to the default values. Especially for the Z values, I just used the default values of Z that are calculated from the different ground motion prediction equations. So we got to start in Berkeley. And um, on the left, you have a, a map of where Berkeley is with respect to the faults. Of course, Berkeley is, um, and the coordinates that I picked are whatever you get from Wikipedia. So it's right in City Hall. Um, and it's less than two kilometers from the Hayward Fault. Uh, this is the case where the deterministic spectrum, on the right I compare the deterministic mean plus one standard deviation and the probabilistic spectrum to really see, okay, in which case does the deterministic control and where does it not? So for Berkeley, for this site here, actually the deterministic is what controls uh, your design spectrum. So there is value to looking at this analysis here, um, even quantitatively. If we do a deaggregation, we see that the standard figure is what you see on the left. I kind of like the ones on the right from the USGS website because it gives you a better perspective as to which faults we're looking at. Uh, Berkeley simple, it's pretty much all Hayward fault. Different magnitude ranges, of course. So if we plot it in a log-log scale, um, you can see that there's not much change to our ground motion predict to the results in your design spectrum um, looking for this site. Uh, but if we actually break it down and we plot it linear linear and we look at the rock site, which is something that's been focused, we've focused on all day, but we actually go to the actual site condition. So this is the site class T. Rel C, uh, relatively stiff or so soft soil. Um, so it's a good representative of somewhere in between. As you can see, if we were on a rock site in Berkeley at the same coordinates, we would actually see a decrease in the overall effect, both in the median and the median plus one, one standard deviation. But you actually calculate the spectral accelerations at your site uh, for a shear wave velocity of 417. You actually see that in some period ranges, uh, your, especially the medium plus one standard deviation goes up in the range of about half a second, and it goes down if you're in the two to three or four second range. Uh, so the effects are different, can be quantified differently depending on what your site conditions are. If we look at the ground motion prediction equations, and what really have to look at this qualitatively is there is the same spread uh, that Nick was talking about. Uh, different cases are different uh, between rock and the soil. If we go to Oakland, and I pick Oakland because it's a much softer site, now we're looking at 200 kilometers, 200 meters per second for the shear wave velocity, and we're a little bit farther away from the Hayward Fault. Now we're looking at 5.7. Uh, you still have a deterministic uh, spectrum controlling your design spectrum. And if we break down the hazard, uh, we still have the same event even controlling uh, your probabilistic um, seismic hazard analysis. As you can see, just for interest, uh, the, the San Andreas Fault picks up a little bit more than it did in Berkeley, of course, because of the relative distances. If we compare the ground motion prediction equations on the average and the median plus one standard deviation, we see that this, there's a definite increase on average, even for the rock site, and a significant increase for a soil site. So there's definitely a significant change going from uh, 2008 to 2013. Um, keep in mind here that I use the default value for the Z, uh, which is really almost a representative of the basin depth. So there would be changes here depending on what you use for Z for the two different ground motion prediction sets. If we look at the ground motion prediction equations individually, again, we have different spread. And what I did here is I really used um, in this case, the Idris actually falls out because it doesn't fit into uh, the 
shear with velocity range that we want. But this is, as Nick pointed out, you really want to evaluate which ground motion prediction equations fit into uh, your site conditions. Uh, but here I really just went and used whatever I could uh, for each site. If we go to San Francisco, San Francisco is an interesting uh, site because it's almost smack in the middle between the San Andreas Fault and the Hayward Fault. But it's far enough from the San Andreas Fault that as much as the deterministic controls your design spectrum, as you can see from the numbers, it's pretty much your deterministic minimum that controls this case from these calculations. So if we look at uh, our deaggregation, we can see that the San Andreas Fault has picked up significantly. But again, we're a whole kilo 11 kilometers away from the source. So if we look at the ground motion prediction equations on average, looking at the median and the median plus one standard deviation, even a rock site in San Francisco would have gone up um, in the same location. But again, the soil conditions really amplify the ground motions uh, with respect to the 2008 uh, ground motion prediction equations in the short period range. Actually does it for the entire period range. Um, again, here's a schematic of the different ground motion prediction equations, and we have a lot more scatter in the 2013 uh, ground motion prediction equations. Sacramento is an interesting site. Now we're shifting over where your probabilistic controls, but I'm still going to go down to the path of deterministic. And as much as the hazard for this site gets a lot more interesting now, uh, we've got the San Andreas Fault coming in. We actually have the subduction zone coming up from uh, Northern California. But what I was actually looking at, just to keep it simple, as I'm looking at uh, the closest fault, which is the Great, the Great Valley Fault at 47 kilometers. Um, so I was actually doing the numbers, and it almost deterministically gives you similar spectra between the San Andreas at a larger uh, distance and larger magnitude. Um, but then again, the point here is to really compare the 2008 and the 2013. And this plot gets thrown out of scale from the ratio, and it's really what I want to get the point across. That's why I didn't rescale it. Uh, the increase going from 2008 to 2013 in both the median and the median plus one standard deviation for both rock and soil has gone up significantly. So, and I think this is consistent with the figures that Nico was showing this morning, that things have definitely changed in the Sacramento Valley. So more detailed analysis and evaluation, you would have to do it for your site. Um, but definitely keep in mind that as you go to those sites. Uh, Sacramento, again, uh, the ground motion prediction equations, uh, there's definitely a wider spread, mainly because this is a linear plot. If we go down to LA, uh, we still have the, the probabilistic controlling um, and looking at just one source. This is pretty much the, the, ha the, uh, the aggregation for the site. And the results in LA are interesting in the fact if we just look at the soil, okay, same pattern. We definitely have an increase in spectra uh, for the soil conditions, but even for the rock conditions, both the median and the median plus one standard deviation, they haven't gone up or stayed the same. They've actually gone down. So if you're in a rock site in LA, your deterministic spectrum has actually gone down with respect to, 20, to 2018. Uh, soil amplification then brings it back up. Uh, this is just the, the spread of the ground motion prediction equations, pretty much consistent with what we were seeing before. Uh, Seattle gets interesting because um, the, the comparison that we can do is limited because the hazard is actually controlled by the subject, subduction zone events. Uh, but if I look at the Seattle fault zone source, which is less than four kilometers away, again, we see something similar to before. Our rock values haven't changed significantly, uh, but we have a significant increase in spectral accelerations in the short period range for soil conditions. And again, the spread of, of seismicity. Uh, Salt Lake City is a different case uh, from the others, mainly because it's uh, the reverse fault that comes into, into play here. And what I'm showing you here, it's a little bit uh, more generic because I'm not even, I'm not turning on the um, hanging wall and then I do afterwards. So without the hanging wall effect, so remember there's really one main fault, which is the Wasatch fault that I'm looking at here. Well, there's a, a group of them actually there. Um, we actually have, without considering the hanging wall effects, we would have a decrease in spectral accelerations for a rock site, and we have a constant almost increase uh, for a soil site. If we turn on our hanging wall, there's definitely an increase both in the um, rock and the soil conditions. 
So putting it all together, it really shows that the, the ground motion prediction equations from NGA West 1 and 2 are definitely in, a step forward in what we're trying to do in building design and performance-based design of doing a better assessment of the hazard and risk at your site. Uh, the changes are significant in the period of interest for typical building sites and uh, building frequencies and, and, and response. Um, but keep in mind that what I'm showing you here is really more of a qualitative approach because I've really shown you the deterministic spectrum for uh, the nearest source. Um, but I think I, I've managed to communicate to you that there is definitely significant change in the period of interest to us. The second place where the updates come, come in is from the ground motion database. And this is pretty exciting because now we have a much larger, um, almost in richer uh, database for, uh, ground motion response ground motion time series. And so we're currently updating uh, the online tool, which was already presented to you this morning. And the nice features about this online tool is uh, it can calculate actually the target spectrum if you're just doing uh, using a, um, I, I think I show it in the next slide. Uh, there are three ways uh, you can calculate using the different ground motion prediction equations. What's online right now has the 2008 ones. Uh, I'm updating that to bring in the 2013 ground motion prediction equations. You can include a user defined spectrum. So a lot of times when you've already gotten your design spectrum, you just upload your target spectrum. Or you can just use a basic one with SD and SD1 values um, for input. Uh, you can do, so you can use it to de define your and upload your target spectrum. You can use it for the selection and the scaling of your ground motions. Selection pretty much is based on uh, the metadata that is available in the flat file. So this is shown for the 2008. Of course, we're widening uh, this list of input values for the 2013 because you will have more. Um, of course, we will have the standard uh, values where you can input them as a user or you can actually just accept um, the default values that are calculated by the ground motion prediction equation developers. And there's also scaling in the tool. So now we're going to be bringing in with the new update, we're extending the data set. So not just more records, uh, but more magnitude and distance combinations. Uh, we're switching over, as was already said this morning, to the ROT D50. We'll also have the ROT D100 and the ROT D0 spectra, as well as something that's kind of dear to me because in the building design, the code is asking you to scale. Uh, the ground motion such that the ISRSS exceeds <coughs> excuse me, your design spectrum. So we're bringing that feature into here. We're switching over to MySQL, so it'll be a lot easier to do all these different calculations. So in summary, there's two places where these updates affect you as a, as a designer in structural engineering. Um, one is in the design spectrum, the ground motion prediction equations. Um, there's a lot more coming out in, in not just the ground motion prediction equations, but different source characterizations. Um, so this is really where combination of knowing what's going on with the maps as well, knowing what's going on if you're doing a site-specific analysis is key. And the ground motion database, just exp expansion of the data set, but also of the different tools that are available. And so in conclusion, this is great stuff for the structural engineers. Uh, not only are we getting better approximate or estimates, of the hazard response and risk at a site. Uh, these tools are really improving the efficiency and consistency. The overall program is great because we're not just doing the, the NGA West, but we're also developing uh, for the subduction and the Central and Eastern North America. But just I think the most value that's coming in from these updates is these seminars that are really educating the, the user, not just the developer of the ground motion prediction equations and the whole hazard. So that you as a structural engineer, if you don't actually do the design spectrum yourself, hopefully you have a better understanding and appreciation and being able to communicate with a geotechnical engineer. Um, so if that, if you have any questions.